This is session number six of Remnant Boot Camp. And today we're going to kind of stay right here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. There's so much in that, and there's so much that we don't know. You know, we've, uh, we've discovered here over the years as I've been teaching that we have been disenfranchised from our Hebraic heritage. And because of that, we have also been disenfranchised from our knowledge of Babylon. Because Judaism was the only contrast to that which sprang out of Babylon in existence in the earth. In 1 John 2 and 18, it says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall rise, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You need to underline whereby or even now there are many, many Antichrists. There is one who's going to be the personification of Lucifer himself, but we need to understand that there are many Antichrists. And we could say it this way of how the world says that there are many roads that lead to salvation. Every one of them have their own little Antichrist that are embedded in it. But what's interesting about all those roads, they don't lead to Jerusalem, they don't lead to heaven, they lead to Babylon. The Greek word here for Antichrist is Antichristos, which means an adversary of the Messiah. Now I want to read out of, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading this morning because I've, I'm in the process of doing a lot of research for my book and it just kind of falls right into place with what we're dealing with this morning. And the first one is taken from Vincent's Word Studies in the New Testament, which any minister should have in their library. And this is what he says about Antichrist, particularly in John in the New Testament, the absence of the article shown its currency as a proper name. It may mean one who stands against Christ, which well, that's our basic thing of Antichrist, like antinomian, one who stands against the law. But he also goes on to say, and one who stands instead of Christ, a replacement Christ, a replacement system for salvation is an Antichrist system. Just as Antichristos may may mean either one who stands in the place of a proprietor or an opposing in general. John never uses a false Christ, while the false Christ is merely a pretender to the messianic office. The Antichrist assails Christ by oppose, by proposing to do or to preserve what he did while denying him. Antichrist, then, is one who opposes Christ in the guise of Christ. So let, let's, let's examine that for a minute. That there's a new age Jesus. There's a Catholic Jesus, which is completely different than the Protestant Jesus. There's a prosperity Jesus. There is a hyper-grace Jesus. So we can have those that hate the gospel, which can try, and we, we see a lot of paganism, they, they hate Jesus. They hate the cross. And so they offer another way of salvation except through the shed blood of Jesus. That's an antichrist. But so is presenting a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. How about a Jesus that doesn't require anything of you at all after you're saved? How does that contrast to where Unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you're not worthy of me. We need, we need to balance these things out. And Babylon has so permeated everything of our society. Guys, when we understand this, it'll go anywhere from the cults that separate from Christianity to Buddhism to transhumanism to secular humanism. They are all antichrist. There is a religious spirit behind every one of those. And so the first character to really understand what's going on with this spirit of Babylon is we have got to understand who Nimrod was. In Genesis 10, verses 8 and 9, it says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth, or a gibberim in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, where it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, in Strong's, Nimrod equals 
rebellion or valiant. It depends on which side you're standing on. On the side of the Mason, on the side of the occult, he was valiant because he railed against the God of heaven and earth and provided another way. But from God's point of view, he's rebellion. He rebelled against anything and everything that is holy. I like what Rabbi, Rabbi Lapin did with the, with the name in Hebrew of Nimrod because in the original Hebrew text, there were no vowel points. And so when a rabbi looks at the word Nimrod, he can actually separate it into two words, which basically is the, the, uh, the essence of who Nimrod is. And when you do that, it says this, and he said, get down. Nimrod elevated himself up above everybody else. And so we, and what's interesting, you find out the Masons claim that the first Mason was Nimrod. That's going to be very crucial on our understanding of a lot of things. And so embedded with the Freemasonry, what do they do? If you're not a Mason, you're below. You're not illuminated. And when they get into politics, they become aristocratic. Everybody gets below them. That's that spirit of Nimrod. We need to understand that Nimrod is the first type and shadow in the Old Testament of the Antichrist. He is also most likely the best foreshadowing of the Antichrist in the entire Word of God. He was the anti-Elohim in the Old Testament, and he will return, the spirit of him will return as the Antichrist in the New Testament. I wanted to look and see what Dake had to say about him. Dake says this, Nimrod comes from the Hebrew word narad, which means to rebel. It points to some violent and open rebellion against God. Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth by bold and daring deeds. His rebellion is associated with the beginning of his kingdom and suggests that he is hunting and his hunting and mighty deeds were related primarily to hunting men by tyranny and force. He lorded over others, hunting and destroying all those that oppose him in his despotic rule over people. This is the meaning understood by Josephus and the writers of the Targums, or the Jewish uh, authorities in writing the Targums. Josephus said that Nimrod persuaded men to ascribe their happiness to him rather than God. Does that sound familiar right now? Ascribe your happiness to the U.S. government? Let the government become God to you. Let the government prepare everything for you and let all your happiness be drawn from what they can open their coffers to do. Let me tell you something. Progressive liberalism didn't come up with this idea. It's the spirit of Nimrod. And if you oppose it, they will show no mercy in their attacks against you. He became a great leader taught people to centralize and defy God, to send uh, send another flood. It is said that Nimrod hunted down wild beasts also, which were killing many people, and taught people to build walls cities, or, or build walls around cities for the protection of them. The term mighty hunter in Genesis 10, 9 could refer to the hunter of animals or men to enslave them. Nimrod was a hunter both of human beings and animals. The Hebrew gibberim translated mighty here means a powerful warrior, tyrant, champion, giant, giant or strong one. I want you to hold that into place for a minute. It is used of giants who are renowned for wickedness and for other wicked men. It could refer to Nimrod as a tyrant and an an oppressive despot. He established the first kingdom and the first universal false religion opposing God since the flood of Noah. This was done before the Lord that is openly in the presence of God with all defiance. That is why God, when he came down to Babel, took action to counteract the rebellion of Nimrod. So he created the first universal false religion. What is all the earth wanting to move to right now? A one world religion. In fact, there are, uh, there are documentaries and there are uh, clips on YouTube that we can see leaders. We can see university professors and others saying, listen, all these people that believe in only one true God, whether you're Jew or Gentile or Christian or even Muslim, 
if they don't give this up for this new one world religion, we need to put them in internment camps. We need to put them in concentration camps. That's being said in America right now. That's being said in other places around the world right now. It is the spirit of Nimrod that is beginning to be emboldened in everything that we're seeing. Tom Horn also talks about Nimrod, and he's going to bring in, remember it said that he, one of the words translated giant, or, or Gibberim, or Gibor, it was a giant. Listen to this. Nimrod, the original character who later was mythologized as the god Apollo. So we have Nimrod is also Apollos. He's also Osiris in, in, uh, in Egyptian. Uh, as, as the god Apollo prophesied by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament and by the occult elite on the great seal of the United States as the ancient spirit that will return to rule or return to earth to rule the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the New World Order. The story of Nimrod in the book of Genesis may illustrate how this could happen through genetic engineering or a retrovirus of demonic design that integrates with the host genome and rewrites the living specimen's DNA, thus making it a fit extension or a host for infection of the entity. Note what Genesis 10.6 says about Nimrod. And Cush begot Nimrod, and he, be, and he began to be a mighty one, a gibberim or a gibor in the earth. Three sections of this unprecedented verse indicate something very particular happened to Nimrod. First note where the text says he began to be in Hebrew is cha'al, which means to become profane, defiled, polluted, uh, desecrated ritually, sexually, or genetically. If you understand Genesis 6, the reason that God destroyed the earth was what the watchers did. They began to defile the genetics of mankind. Somehow or another, Nimrod was able to replicate that. And he became something other than a man that empowered him to do what he did in Babylon. Secondly, this verse tells us exactly what Nimrod began to do as he changed genetically, a mighty one or a gibberim, one of the offspring of the Nephilim. As Janet Hishoko Reed says in the Cambridge University book, Fallen Angels and the History of Judaism and Christianity, the Nephilim of Genesis 6, 4, and were, are, are always grouped together with the gibberim as the progeny of the watchers and the human women. And the third part of this text says that, that uh, the change in Nimrod started when he was on the earth. Therefore, in modern language, this text could actually be translated to say, and Nimrod began to change genetically to become a gibberim, the offspring of the watchers on the earth. When you understand that, that is why he is so highly esteemed by every Freemason on the planet. That's why he is considered the, the first Freemason that ever existed. He became something other than human. There, there was a uh, transmutation that went on on the inside of him. He became something else. We see that all throughout the occult, the ability to, to become something else. In fact, the, the old thing about alchemy of turning lead into gold was a metaphor of turning a man into a god. And that's exactly what transhumanism is trying to do. Every mason is using occultic workings if they actually understand their craft. Manly P. Hall said in his book on the lost keys of Freemasonry that when a master mason perfects his craft, he has the seething powers of Lucifer flowing in his hands. There's a purpose for that. And now we see every major government on the planet, thanks to the transhumanist movement, the new weapons programs that are being conducted. It's not the atomic bomb anymore. Now, Iran is really a step behind the scene. They're trying to do what a lot of the world had already did back in, in, the, in the 40s with the atomic bomb. The new arms race is going to be for the super soldier creating gibberim, creating Nephilim. And it's all to set the stage for when the Antichrist comes. He's going to become a man. He's going to be just a regular man until he has a mortal wound that he receives, as, da as both Daniel and the book of Revelation prophesies, 
and that when he's brought back to life, it's going to be by the use of transhumanist technology that he becomes a Gibrain. And he becomes literally Satan himself, the reincarnation of Nimrod, if I want to use pagan terminology, because that's what it's all about, to bring back. On the back of your $1 bill, it announces that Apollo is coming back. Apollo is another word for Nimrod. Then Nimrod is going to return. Why is that significant? Peter Goodgame, and he has a on, on the on the internet on his website, he has done a lot of research, and one of the interesting things that he has found, they have dis- archaeologists have discovered the tomb of Osiris. It was underneath the Sphinx. It wasn't it wasn't in a pyramid. It was underneath the Sphinx. What does that mean? They now have the DNA of Nimrod. One of the reasons that we went into Iraq, I I actually had a student call me on a sat phone sitting on Saddam Hussein's throne (laughs) in Baghdad or wherever it is up there. And one of the things that I've discovered with some of our students that have reported back to me, the very first thing they secured was not the palace. It was a ziggurat in Iraq. And immediately archaeological teams were brought in because that is where Gilgamesh was buried, another historic and famous Nephilim that is written about in Babylonian lore. They need to have this DNA so that they can, they can recombine DNA to recreate the Nephilim. In fact, I believe it's a part of the mark of the beast. So we have the physical stuff, we have the spiritual stuff, all coming together, opposing Christ. One of the things that they're saying is, you don't have to worry about death anymore because we're going to recreate immortality. If we can't do it by reprogramming your DNA so that you don't grow old, we'll simply upload your consciousness into a machine. I don't know about you, but I don't want to look like a, I don't want to be walking around as a trash compactor for the rest of my life, you know, for eternity. But what they're saying is you don't have to worry about judgment. We have another way. There's this concept of ascending is universal within all the occult. Even Buddha ascended. But in his version of ascended, when you ascend, you become nothing. That's nirvana. Well, there's a promise Satan can always keep. If you ascend and become nothing, he wins. No, there's no promise here. Go ahead and do all this all your life, and when you, when you actually achieve it, you become nothing. Kind of sounds to me like a lot of our politicians' promises anymore are just all Buddha. (laughs) Everything they speak goes into absolute nirvana, becomes nothing immediately after they get into office. But Nimrod and Babylon are ground zero for all paganism and all occultism in the world. When they're talking about coming back to a one world religion, they're trying to get us back to the Tower of Babel. They had a one world religion. And God said, because you have it, there's nothing impossible. There, there's no limit to the corruptness that you can do. And I've already promised the world I'm not going to destroy it again. So what I'm going to do is confuse your languages. And that's why when the, the, in Babylon there's three main characters. There's Nimrod, there's Semiramis, and there's Tammuz. You go into Egypt, it's Osiris. It's Isis and Horus. Same thing. The only thing in in reality, when you go back and you understand the story, because they introduced child sacrifice, they introduced human sacrifice, all these different things. Their gods required blood. That when Seth heard about it, he went and killed Nimrod over it and cut his body into pieces and sent it to to uh, to the different cities of Babylon and said, if you keep this up, I'm coming after you too. And therefore, it became occult it became hidden to protect from Seth but yet within Egyptian folklore he's called Seth he's the evil one who killed Osiris and cut him into pieces and then Isis his wife's sister couldn't put them all back together and Babylon his wife was his mother Semiramis who later on also had the ability to ascend and become a god we call her Easter And so after the spring equinox every year, she comes down in a multicolored Easter egg. 
and gives the rabbit the power of to lay eggs to prove that she's a goddess. That's what they believe. They have a sunrise service because she comes at sunrise. You see how all these things come back in and they amalgamate themselves back into what we believe. And the Apostle John is warning us about all this. There are many antichrists that come in that try to do things. Now I want to quote this morning. It's called The Curse of Canaan, A Demonology of History. And it says this, Nimrod, who was born on December 25th, the high Sabbath of Babylon, was the founder of Babylon in the city of Nineveh. In the history of mankind, Nimrod stands unequaled for his symbolism of evil and satanic practices. He is credited to having founded Freemasonry and for building the legendary Tower of Babel in defiance of God's will. In Talmudic literature, he is noted as the one who made all people rebel against God. The legend of the Midrash recounts that when Nimrod was informed of Abraham's birth, he ordered all the male children killed to be certain of eliminating him. Abraham was hidden in a cave, but in later life he was discovered by Nimrod, who then ordered him to worship fire, and and Abraham refused and was thrown into the fire and survived. Now that's just Talmudic. We don't know necessarily if that really happened. The legendary symbol of Nimrod is the X. The use of this symbol always denotes witchcraft. When X is used as a shortened form, meaning Christmas, it actually means to celebrate the feast of Nimrod. A double X which always meant a double cross or betrayal is the fundamental meaning indicating one betrayed into the hands of Satan. When American corporations use the X in their logo, such as Exxon, the historic Rockefeller firm of Standard Oil of New Jersey, there could be little doubt of this hidden meaning. Or how about this one, triple X. There's X-rated stuff. Oh, pornography and all these different things came from the Nephilim. One of the things I document in the new book that I'm writing is that pedophilia, homosexuality, and bestiality all came from the Watchers and from the Nephilim. That's some of the knowledge that they brought. And it was part of their religious practice. And so now, even, even our, our movie industries put the symbol of Nimrod on it just to show us where it came from. The importance of Nimrod in any study of the occult cannot be overemphasized. Because of the powers given him by the clothing of Adam and Eve, Nimrod became the first man to rule the whole world. He he, uh, indulged that power by launching access in horrors that have never been equaled. Ever since the time of Nimrod, Babylon has been the symbol of depravity and lust. Nimrod also introduced the practice of genocide to the world. His father, Ham, having consorted with other races and brought children of mixed races into the world, was persuaded by his consort, the evil uh, Nama, to practice ritual murder and cannibalism. She informed him that by killing and eating fair-skinned people, his descendants could gain their superior qualities. Throughout the ensuing centuries, the fair-skinned descendants of Shem, uh, Noah's eldest son, have, uh, have ritually been slaughtered by the darker descendants of Ham and Nimrod in the world's most persistent campaigns of race and religious persecution. Not only did Nimrod kill and eat the fair-skinned descendants of Shem in his fury and hatred, he often burned them alive. The type of human sacrifice involved in the eating of the slaughtering of human victims derived its name from the combining of the name of his uncle Canaan and the demon god Baal. The two names combined formed the word uh, uh, cannibal. Nimrod was known in historic history by the name Murdoch, Bel, and Muradoch. But of his importance in history, Babylon was known as the land of Nimrod. Nimrod is also cited as the most ancient Mason uh, constitutions as the founder of Freemasonry. So anything that stems from Freemasonry, guys, is going to gravitate toward the Antichrist. That's the very foundation of it. Anything that stems from, if you understand Babylon... Then there was one who, who secondarily personified Babylon. 
His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he had a, a dream and a vision. And so the secret knowledge that he had, because Nebuchadnezzar was the high priest slash king, which is another type of antichrist because Jesus is going to be the king and the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he had all the mystery religion knowledge that allowed him to build his kingdom. That's why you, you have with, with Nebuchadnezzar, you have him one day declaiming that there's no God like God, and the next day he's claiming that he's a God. And God has to, has to make him eat, like a, eat grass like a cow and is the first one who had lycanthropy. Thinking that's where we get the legend of werewolves from was from Nebuchadnezzar. All that stems from the spirit that came from Babylon. In the master plan of the Illuminated Rothschilds, we find this quote. The Illuminati is a Luciferian religion that is a counterfeit to the church of Jesus Christ, not the Mormon one. Illuminati means the light bearers of the enlightened one. The Illuminati belief system says that freedom is only obtained through the entrance of true and pure light or sodomy and life. Sacrifice is only obtained through death. They tell their people that nothing can ever penetrate the, that power because of the unholy trinity of Cain, Nimrod, and Joseph seals it. The core religion of their belief system comes from the Cabal, a book containing mysticism and written by a sect of the Pharisees who went into Babylon after the destruction of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, the holy language of the Illuminati is Hebrew. That doesn't mean they're all Jews. The Word of God talks about that there is, there is those that are the synagogue of Satan. That's the Illuminati. There is a small portion of them that are Jewish, yes. But they, they come from every nation, and there, there are 13 bloodlines that make up the Illuminati that are forcing us into this one world religion. There are many antichrists, and they control, they control even most of Christianity today. That's why we see so much has gone off the rails. Have you ever noticed things keep on getting weirder and weirder on Christian television? They keep on getting further and further from preaching the truth. This whole concept of pulling, God, pulling people away from God using a thousand different names. Guys, every religion on this planet except Judaism and true biblical Christianity come from Babylon. Every single one. Some of the names have been changed because of the, the, the scramble language. But they either they do one of two things. They either promise you another way of getting to heaven, another way of salvation, or they promise you godhood, which both goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the tree in the Garden of Eden. And there, those religions right now are in ascendancy in the world today. They're in ascendancy right now in America. Christianity is no longer the moral majority. We are the moral minority. And we need to understand where this is placing us. This is why God says that there are many antichrists from the world. And this goes all the way from Freemasonry to transhumanism. They all seek enlightenment to ascend or transform into something bypassing God's salvation through the shed blood of Jesus upon the cross and to live a life in which God's commandments are not central. Now, for a true believer, how I many know the cross of Christ is central? The commandments of God are central. Now that I'm saved, I live by his kingdom. If you preach a bloodless salvation that's greasy grace and that you can live any way that you want to afterward is another gospel. Let's go on to, to uh, 1 John 2 and 19. And they went up from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. He's talking about this specifically of Antichrist. One of them we could say was Marcion, separated from them later on, and many others. But even in today, most major cults that are the biggest threat to Christianity all started in Christianity. Armstrongism, the Worldwide Church of God. Now, they've done some changing here lately, but they are considered a cult by the way that they treat the blood of Christ and their idea of what salvation really means. Mormonism. All Joseph Smith did is he started a church based upon what Freemasons believed. Jehovah Witnesses. 
in the modern today, the emergent church. Truth is like springs. If truth is like springs, you're on bad ground, dude. Truth needs to be concrete. If it's truth, it never, ever changes. You see, that's what a witch would tell you. I've talked to some and tried to explain the gospel and look at you and say, well, that's your truth. In other words, I bounced on the bed of truth and it sprung another way. No, Jesus is the rock. Try jumping down, up and down on a big rock for a while. You'll find out just how movable that rock is. It doesn't move. The emergent church is of an antichrist spirit. It's drawing men away from God. Now instead of preaching the cross and preaching a crucified life, they're preaching best life now. God's got a wonderful plan for you. This is going to be rosy, peachy, keen, and you're never going to have any problems. And no matter how you act, God's going to love you and accept you because of the cross. That flows right into hyper grace. You can fill stadiums by preaching. You don't have to do anything. God's just going to accept you, and now that you're family, you can get away with anything. How many are glad for grace? Grace is not only the ability to respond to the preaching of the cross, but live a life that is in line with the cross once you get saved. We have hyper faith. We've had those that say, you know, you don't have to have faith in God, you just have to have faith in your faith. And it's almost like you become a demigod if you're not careful. You can take any truth of God's word that you take and, and you make uh, more significant and more prominent than all the other truths, you can, you can replace it and become another gospel. Everything has to stay in balance. Or how about hyper, hyper pro, uh, prosperity? I can prove to you I walk with God. I have $7 million. Well, so did Nimrod. So did most Illuminati. None of them walk with God. And you've gotten to the place that if you, if you prove your spirituality by the money that you have, then you have the love of money. Which, what, what does the Bible tell us? It's the root of all evil. Show me a holy life. Show me someone consecrated to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see how, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're approaching that time that we're going to have the Cain spirit and we're going to have the Abel spirit once again. There is a war coming. It's already begun. And most Christians are, 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 are flowing around in the Cain spirit and it hasn't fully manifested itself yet because they are religious in nature and they don't really know Jesus. Once you know Jesus, all this junk doesn't matter to you anymore. You see through it quickly because you know him. If you're just religious, you will follow any religious spirit with whatever teachings going on in the world. Guys, all of these groups redefine what it is required, what it is required to be saved and how one conducts their lives as a believer after they're saved. Now, John's epistle stands in the face of the manifestations of the Antichrist spirit and judges them as either those standing against Christ or offering a replacement to the true Messiah with a Babylonian one. That's why, guys, it's important. Everything that we do, every holiday that we celebrate, go back and research its origin. Does it lead to Jerusalem or does it lead to Babylon? Babylon. People don't like it when I say that because you find out that 99.2% of everything that you do, even in the church many times, leads all the way back to Babylon. And the remnant are waking up to this. That's why 1 John was one of the last books written. It was written after the book of Revelation because in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that if it, if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Why? Because all of our traditions line up to the one that's coming, and it's not Christ. If, you, if everything that you're doing lines up with Babylon, you will accept a Babylonian Christ if you're not careful. That is why it's so important, guys. How many know John knew what he was talking about? In fact, I, I kind of imagine he has pondered before he wrote 1 John, he was pondering about all the things that God showed him. And I'm sure he's like most preachers. Boy, I wish I could have wrote a sequel because I've had 
15 years to think about all the things that I saw. Well, he kind of did it. A few years later, he wrote First John saying, you know, with what's coming, if you don't have these things in place and you don't understand what the Antichrist spirit is, first, the first epistle of John speaks more of the Antichrist than any other book in the Bible because he knew he was coming. And it's time for us to prepare ourselves because we're almost, we're almost at the place, guys, where the curtain is going to be drawn back. And the Antichrist is going to be revealed, and much of the church and all of the world are going to rally around him. Only the remnant of God are going to say, you're not the God of the Bible, and I refuse to. Father, we just ask you this morning, Father, give us strength. Father, give us clarity of spirit, give us clarity of mind that we can truly know you and know your ways and that we will have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to begin extracting everything out of our lives that stems from Babylon so that we can be like Jesus when Jesus told the devil, you have nothing in me. Father, let us have nothing in our lives that smacks of Babylon. But Father, let everything that we do and everything that we are go all the way through Jerusalem to the very throne of God. And Father, we, we ask that you would do it in our lives, that you would give us the grace to separate good from evil, clean from unclean, light from darkness. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. <laughs>